This is Las Vegas Real Estate Now with local real estate expert Harvey Blankfeld. Where we want to educate you about our market, empower you to make wise decisions, and help you engage with our expert contributors. We got a bunch of stuff I want to talk about today, Danielle. But first, let me just do the stats. Let's get them done uh, right away because I want to share this with everybody just so they see what's been happening here in the Valley. And I'm going to start with my report on single family homes. Again, this is just single family homes for the last week. And so you can see as of today, currently available, we have 5,117 homes. In the last seven days, put 889 in escrow. That's down a little bit from last week. And the inventory's down a little bit from last week too. We've closed 924 homes. That's up a lot. That's a nice number, 924 homes in the last seven days. 200 homes have been withdrawn. That's a pretty big number of withdrawals. Median sold price was 342,250. Again, when we talk about the median sold price uh, on a week's worth of data, it's not as significant as when you do a bigger sample, but it's an interesting number and it's and it's up quite a bit. Um, and then the median sold price per square foot, which might be a little more accurate, but also still a small sample size is 181 and change. The days on market is 36. That's up two from the last time. I'm going to I'm going to go back a bit. I want to show you guys. I haven't done this in a while. I'm going to go back to when we first started doing these podcasts back in March. And I want to show you where we stood back on March 26th. We had 5,655 homes. So we've lost at least five or at least 500 last week, but 448 in escrow. We closed 567, 200 were withdrawn and the median price was 317 and change. So significant changes from from back in March till now. What was May's numbers? Because I think that's when we really started to see. Yeah, May, May's an interesting number. effect on our market. Yep, let me show, let me pull up May. Hang on a second here, here we go. May, in May we had a lot more inventory. We had 6,300, 6,400 homes available. We had bigger inventories. We had decent number of closings between six and seven, six, seven and 800 homes uh, in escrow every week. But we only were only, we were only closing between three and 400 a week. So we weren't closing as many then. But the median price was going up. And the days on market was a little bit longer then too. It was just a little bit higher back in May. You've seen the number creep up the whole time. It's been going in, uh, it's been in the 330s for some time now. And um, median sold price this week, a 342. I think that, again, sample, the sample size is small and a couple houses can skew it. I get asked this all the time, is there, is there gonna be a crash? And, and, the, and the simple answer that I give is no, I don't see that. There's no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I could be wrong, but there's no indication of that at all. Um, the demand is there. Also, the most important factor, and we talk about this a lot, is everyone who owns a home now has been thoroughly vetted by lenders. Um, they don't own the home with no money down. They don't own the home without any assets. As a matter of fact, they're vetted to the point of pain <laughs> half the time because lenders are so scrutinous right now. And so it becomes a real challenge. Um, so I would say, no, the, it's not there. And the prices continue to go up. Yeah, they want the blood of your firstborn child, I tell people. <laughs> they do. It's, it's, it's crazy. There's other, other news this week, Danielle, and you know this. Um, we saw uh, earlier this week the governor came out and told us that we can start to do open houses again. Yay! With some restrictions that With, we're still trying to get clear on. Right, right. right. We're trying to get the, 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 Good news. The, the skinny. Our broker just sent us an email just a few hours ago telling us about uh, some of the rules and regs. And maybe we'll, let's go through some of that stuff. But, but let me just, you, while, you're, while you're looking at that, I'm going to run through this article real, real quick. Uh, Sabrina Hudson put this in the RJ, and it just basically says that the open houses have started. Uh, she interviewed our president, Tom Blanchard, and he said, and he said, yay. You know, he was like, yeah, yeah, good news for everybody. Um, he also said that this also allows investors now to market their homes where they couldn't before because we couldn't show homes with tenants in it. So he thinks we're going to see a little more inventory come out. Which is huge. Yeah, I we need it. I, we definitely need that. We need the inventory. We do. We, indeed, we need the inventory. So for me, that's not a big problem. I, I like that. We need the inventory. We've got buyers out there looking for property. The number of available listings at the end of August declined 3.5% from July to 4,639 homes. Uh, he's talking about the median price also being in the mid-330s and up over almost 10% from last year. Um, but he does expect to see uh, an increase, but he doesn't expect it to affect pricing because of what you and I just said. We need the homes. We need more homes to sell right now. There's lots of buyers out there looking for property. But but tell us tell us about some of the rules that our broker shared with us. Let's talk about what the what the new rules are with regard to open houses. Well, we can obviously have open houses 
and showings. We were able to show owner-occupied property the whole time, except the owner had to give permission, which we which we were doing. Right. They were gladly allowing us, for the most part. Most people were. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't show tenant-occupied properties or even ask, but now we're able to do that as long as the owners and the tenants that are living there are not there when we show it. Right, they can't be present. They can't be present. And okay. then they can't be present at the open house, not that they would be anyway. So oh. the prospective buyer could include, because when we first read it, I thought, oh, just one buyer. What happens if it's husband and wife? Right. It's one agent showing the prospective buyer. That could be buyer and buyer spouse, domestic partner, business partner, or family members. Right. So that it's kind of like a group. So whoever's going to be on the contract, essentially, to a certain extent, or the family members associated. Right. right. And you had an experience... Uh, recently with a client, and I think we should talk about it, as it relates to um, being properly qualified as a lender and earnest money. Those are two key factors in that story. So tell everyone a little bit about what happened with your with your listing. Well, we're going <laughs> over the contract and asking what type of earnest money they want, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, it's a good amount it, and it's and it's amount that, you know, the earnest money isn't important until it's important. And that's when bags are packed, sellers are moved out, they're paying another mortgage payment. And then if there's no earnest money, that's going to make a buyer, you know, perform. Right. When there's not enough earnest money and they don't care about losing it, they're not going to be, you know, trying to rush the process and make sure that things move and it right. to close because we're having a struggle right now. Yeah. There are deadlines within the contract for a reason because the seller has business to conduct beyond the sale of this house as well. It seems to me that there are brokers around town teaching their agents to encourage their buyers to ask put in less earnest money in a transaction. Now, in my mind, the word earnest means, yes, I really want to buy this home. I'm earnest in my desire to purchase this property. And the earnest money is the money I'm putting into the deal to show you that I really want to buy this property. So when a seller, now, tip, now I'm going to tell you, there's no rules about earnest money. There's no standard. There's nothing written down. It must be this much or it should be that much. But I, as a rule for me, what I've always done for my sellers is I've asked for around roughly one and a half percent of the sales price, roughly. And it, it, and, it, and it varies from that. It's not consistent, but roughly that kind of a number. So if I have a $300,000 house on the market, I'm probably asking for $5,000 in earnest money. That's where my head's going to be. Maybe, you know, that's what I'm going to ask for. And when a buyer submits an offer and says they only want to put $1,000 earnest money in, what are they telling me and my seller? They're saying... Gee, we're concerned we might lose our money, so we don't want to put too much in there. That's not earnest. That's, and the only way they're going to lose it is if they default. They have a number of contingencies they can go away, they can walk away from the transaction over several weeks prior to closing that they can walk away and still get their earnest money back. But this is a this is a this is a growing problem, I think, in our market right now. I've seen it a number of times, and you had a bad experience where you had low earnest money. And the buyer, as it turns out, probably you know, he couldn't perform or might not be able to perform. We're not really sure yet. Fingers crossed that they do. But yeah. yes, and, yeah. and the earnest money wasn't, you know, the sellers were didn't need it to be more than it was. And right. They were okay with it. Right. And they made that choice and they're okay with that. Yeah. But now when, you know, tension's running high and we, they were supposed to have closed, it's yeah. it's important. So, if, like I said, it's not important until it's important and bags are packed. Yeah. And also choosing the right lender. Yeah. You know, it's we're all driven by okay, what's the lowest rate? But I think also that's important is good communication. They have a good history. Um, it, just vetting that lender um, for the on behalf of the seller, letting them know about the conversations and your history and working with them. Don't you think the buyer would have a significant amount of leverage with the lender? Should they go to the lender and say, "Listen, if I don't close this on time, I'm at risk of losing my five thousand dollars." As opposed to, if I don't close this thing on time, I'm at risk of losing my $1,000. Now, $1,000 is a lot of money, but it's not $5,000. No, and not. and it's intended. The seller wants to know that the buyer the buyer would, would feel pain for not closing the deal or for defaulting. And not, I'm not saying pain in a literal sense, but I'm just saying financial pain. Because the seller has been damaged. The seller has lost, particularly in a market right now, as we're going into the holidays, and it might be a little slower, who knows? The house has been off the market for a while, and, and then now they, they've got to put it back on the market. It might be another three months before they close the deal. Please join us again next week as we keep you up to date on everything real estate here in Southern Nevada. Remember, send me any questions or ideas for next week's broadcast. Tune in every Thursday at 3. Also, please let your friends and family know to like our Facebook page and be reminded about our updates at LV Real Estate Radio. We'll catch you next week.
Thanks again for joining us.